A uh, very good morning to all of you. Um, we had two very interesting sessions yesterday, and I was absolutely enthralled by every speaker. Now, today we are in for equally interesting sessions, and this morning we meet mathematics squarely because this morning's session is going to deal with something that I find difficult sometimes, canons, okay, except for three blank mice, I guess. <laughs> um, musicians, especially composers and analysts, you know that canons embody much that is abstruse, mathematical, and complex about music. And they can do that. Okay? And so the canon is an extremely good topic for our uh, conference, Better Musical Conversations. And we have three extremely distinguished speakers who will speak and play as well. And uh, I'm going to introduce uh, them, all of them very briefly, and then, in, uh, and then they'll speak. We have three, our three distinguished speakers, of course. Uh, right next to me is Professor Noam Elkis, a very distinguished mathematician. Professor of Mathematics, Harvard University, but the things about him that I didn't quite know. Um, I'm a physicist, so I don't know everything about you. <laughs> of course, he was the youngest professor at Harvard, gold medal with a perfect score at IMO at age 14. And uh, one is the youngest Putnam Fellow at Columbia. And um, it's also, are you a chess master? I'm a chess master, yeah. I'm at, but better at solving problems. Right. And actually, to everybody's surprise, but most of all my own, I won the first time I tried the world championship at solving problems, or oh, I've never managed okay. to do that again. Okay, <laughs> but you are a chess master. That's right. Right. Yeah. right. So, of course, he's a distinguished mathematician, but he's a distinguished musician as well. A pianist, as we're going to hear, composer. And improviser, I saw that. I will be improvising I saw a bit, yeah. See, which is very intriguing as well. So he'll, he'll speak uh, immediately after this. Our second speaker is Professor Moreno Andreati. Andreata from Urcap, yeah. the fount of all wisdom in computer <laughs> music. Okay. Uh, I had the honor to be there once. And of course, he, he runs the master's course at Urcap, and his research activities are based on just right for our conference, the relationships between mathematics and music. And in particular, he's interested in the algebraic formalization of musical structures and processes, something which uh, is very close to the subject of this conference. He'll speak after this. Okay. Our third speaker is Professor Clifton Callender, professor of composition at Florida State University, a very distinguished composer who has had many significant commissions but unlike many professors of composition, his uh, research interests seem to be uh, they, they read like a mathematician's uh, resume. Uh, let me try to see what they are. Fourier based harmonic theory, geometrical music theory, new Riemannian theory, that's uh, okay. I, I think I'll stop there. And uh, <laughs> it's, uh, of course, both as professor of composition and as a researcher, he has many performances, and his articles have been published in all the major music journals, uh, Perspectives of New Music, New Music Theory, and other journals. Okay, so I'll treat as a new speakers. Without, I think um, we will do what the other sessions have done and leave all questions to the, to the end of the session, if that's okay. Our first speaker, Professor Nomelkis, will speak on canonical forms, mathematical view of musical and then speak and play, I think. Thank you. Can this be heard? Yeah, I guess so. Uh, so I didn't actually plant this, but in fact, you remember from the introduction that the uh, canons were felt as somehow, you know, this complicated, forbidding thing, except for three blind mice. Everybody knows three blind mice, right? Ooh. 
the top of that you read the area that you three blind mice. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, and of course, the, it's an example of a canon, and uh, it's a, an example that we somehow recognize as a relatively uh, you know, straightforward, not to say trivial in the mathematical sense of a canon. And I want to, since I have only half an hour here, I want to explore a bit, a, a, you know, what is sort of a, tep a typology, if you will, of canons. And, oh, okay, but you can hear me in any case. A typology, if you will, of canons. And what makes some of them much easier to construct than others, uh, on the one hand, will be things like three blind mice and uh, Frère Jacques, which are, turn out to be so simple that we have another word for them. They're called rounds. Two simple two-part canons, which it will turn out you can actually make up on the spot, as I will, as I will show. Two more complicated constructions, which uh, exist only in you know, very special cases. And also, you know, some of the tricks of how one goes about making a canon beyond just the, you know, the first order algorithm that essentially everybody learns how to do. So, uh, just even though uh, we have probably a higher uh, rate of musical literacy here than I can ever assume otherwise when giving this talk, I will still stick with my usual not quite musical notation. So A doesn't mean the note A, it just means if you have a two-part canon, or any number of parts, it's it's a bit of music that is the first cell of music that you hear when, you only, when there's only one, port, one voice. So if it were three blind mice, then A would be three blind mice, three blind mice, and then the next part comes in, three blind mice, etc. while the second part goes on to see how they run, see how they run, so the, the double see how they run is B, this is, then A happens at the same time as B, and so I'm building here a kind of musical score. This is part one, this is part two. Part one starts with the rest, longer than a quarter, unless you sing it too fast. Uh, and then, of course, there is a tune. So there is, so in general, a canon is a solution to a particular kind of counterpoint challenge. So there is a tune, so you have to know how to write tunes. And you have to know how to do counterpoint, if they have to know how to make two parts of music that, besides being reasonable tunes individually, also sound well together. And for the most part, I'm almost entirely going to be talking about Western music, just because Western music is essentially the only place where we have counterpoint to begin with. You cannot have counter canons without counterpoint. There is one counterexample that, that I'm aware of, which is that there is rhythmic counterpoint in some traditions of African drumming, and yes, there is a tradition of canonical writing in African drumming. And if you come to my tea time performance tomorrow, I guess it is, I will play a uh, piece of piano music that I wrote that is sort of two generations removed from one of these African drumming games. The first generation being uh, Steve Reich's slapping music and the second generation being my adding actual you know, pitched music to the clapping, but that's a different discussion. So for the most part, we are here in Western music, but even in Western music, there is this undefined term here, which is what does it mean for two sn snap snitch snatches of music to go together with each other? There is this undefined notion here, A twiddle B as we usually write it, A goes together with B in harmony, what that means depends on what kind of music you're writing. It would mean something different for Mozart than it would for Messian. And depends on, you know, depending on what this means and also on what kind of tunes you're writing, you'll have, you know, different details of what kind of canons you will be writing, what they will sound like. But I'm going to try to abstract all of this out, so there have to be some simple axioms that this, that this satisfies, like Every A always twiddles itself. Uh, if A twiddles B, then B twiddles A. Almost always. Uh, and there are <coughs> axioms that are not true. It's not an equivalence relation. Uh, just because two things twiddle the same A doesn't mean they twiddle each other. And so, you know, based on these axioms, we try to construct some solutions to this. So there are, of course, the trivial solutions. 
So one trivial solution, if you can write a mute, if you can write a tune at all, well, you can have a canon. Well, you can't have a canon in one part because that's not a canon. I mean, that's. I mean, it's, it's it is according to some mathematical definition, just as you know, cages four minutes and 33 seconds, the zero part canon. But we're not really interested in that when we're trying to construct canons. Uh, you can imagine a canon at the interval of zero, but that's not really a canon either because you remember anything twiddles itself, and so uh, as soon as A, B, C, D makes a reasonable tune, you can just play it in parallel octaves or unisons, and that will, you know, be a trivial kind of canon. In fact, we recognize implicitly that this counts as, you know, this somewhat is, is cheating. And when we teach a student's counterpoint, we discourage them from this kind of cheating by telling them you are not allowed to write parallel octaves and fifths. You are allowed to write parallel thirds, but not for very long. I mean, you can only go on for like that for a while for, you know, either we tell them, okay, now please write actual counterpoint, or it just becomes a kind of, uh, what's the word, it's a tone quality instead of being actual two-part counterpoint. So there is this kind of trivial solution, and there is everybody's other kind of trivial solution where all of the A's are the same. Now, you might think that that violates the other condition of a canon, which is say, yes, everything twirls itself fine, but A, 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 A is not much of a tune. Uh, however, there are, you know, musicians have found more interesting ways of realizing this basic structure. It can be an A major triad. which is the subject of a, one of the uh, 24 Shostakovich fugues. And of course, if that's your subject, then any, any, uh, any kind of can you make with it will work. And so you have no problem making a uh, stretto. Usually, if you write a fugue that's going to have a stretto, you have to start out with a theme and figure, you know, you have to start out by figuring out the stretto, you know, figuring out the, the canon that's going to work and then working back from that. But here it's easy, right? I mean, it's bound to work. And that goes with Shostakovich's general uh, aesthetic in these pieces, where the point of stretch is not the point of highest energy, but the point of return, where it's sort of a recap. It's a varied recap, but it's not, you know, we are seeing that it's not the same kind of maximal overlay of canons that we see in a classical like Bach or, uh, or Brahms stretto. So, uh, that, so A, 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 et cetera, can be, you know, just a sequence of, co just a sequence of uh, you know, the same major chord, or more generally, it can be the same harmony. And that is what gives rise to what are known as rounds. That the, that's the word for things like, Three blind mice, three blind mice. And so it almost has to work because it's all basically working off this. And it's true for any other canon, any other round that uses the same A pattern. So, for example, I think even a better known canon is Frere Jacques. And that happens to be the same. Which, of course, has the corollary that you can play both of them against each other. And if you didn't know any better, you'd think it was some kind of amazing eight-part double can canon in four, in four parts or whatever, whereas it's really just this multiplied by eight. Uh, you know, it's, so there are these trivial solutions, and of course there is still a bit of non-triviality that arises here, which comes back to trying to make 
a reasonable linear tune, there is still some shape to it. And then we do it a third time before we come back. And yes, your music, history, your music theory first, first year students will say, hey, wait, that's parallel octaves, but that's okay because we're not, you know, sort of writing trivial counterpoint in any way. Okay. Uh, so once we go past that, everybody knows how you write a basic two part canon. Who has ever had to, had to do such an exercise? You don't start from a tune and then just hope that it works in canon itself because then you'll have the kind of quote unquote canon where the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. Uh, that only works if you have the other kind of trivial canon which is a canon in which everything twitters everything else. That's why we are not usually too excited by canons in uh, you know, various kinds of uh, atonal music where essentially every vertical sound, every harmony is deemed to be acceptable because if every harmony is acceptable, then writing a canon is just a matter of playing the same tune and not quite starting at the same time. Uh, <coughs> so if you have some non-trivial uh, harmonic condition, you don't just start with a tune, you start with the first section. So maybe A is, uh, oh, I don't know. Uh, and before you write a note of B, you write your note A in the second part, your, your notes of A in the second part. And then B has to continue the melody of A, but also has to make sense with the, say, with the A that you have here. And if you have learned counterpoint, you can write a melody that continues something you've started with and works in harmony with what you've done before. And once you do that, you know what's going to happen in part two here. And of course, oh, and of course, there is, you know, once you have done that, there is a recursion, and you keep doing this. Maybe. And at some, at some point, you have to end. And usually, even when Bach is writing canons, he usually take advantage of the one. Uh, the one exception we usually allow, which is towards the end, it makes some kind of, uh, of dramatic sense for voices to enter one at a time. It's a rather unusual situation for voices to depart one at a time, unless you're writing the farewell symphony. And so usually, you would finish off by letting the, la the second voice, or in however many other voices, finish just before, just before the end of the end of the tune so they can all finish at the same time and you're even allowed to change the, the form of the next to last thing to make both of them into a more convincing final cadence. So perhaps... Now, I didn't make this up on the spot, uh, but in some sense I could have. And as soon as the topic of improvisation comes up, there is this question that we'd call in computer science protocols. They say, how can I be sure, that, how can I convince you that I'm actually improvising and not just playing through something I've already prepared as if it were an improvisation? Or for that matter, playing, you know, picking a random number from one to 600 and playing that question number and pretending it's something I'm making up. Uh, and so the only way we know it is to have a protocol, somebody whom I haven't colluded with before, gives me an initial snippet of music, this A, and I have to go from it to make sure I can't just, uh, I can't just, uh, you know, play something, some prepared bit of music. So, uh, maybe you can, since you're our master of ceremony this morning, if you don't want to, we have two other panelists, can you give me just a few notes to start with? <laughs> Whatever. I think Phil is good. Okay. Okay. 
That's more notes than usually you get, but let's see. Wait, how many notes? One, two, three, four. Okay, so I'll interpret the first note as being a dotted whatever, so it adds up to 12. Okay, let's see what happens. Um, Okay, uh, thanks, I apologize that this didn't go on as these things usually do because you've given me so many notes that it's harder to remember what the left hand did while the time I have to, you know, we only have a limited uh, memory, you know, short-term memory capacity and I think if you listen to the recording you'll hear that I actually, you know, took advantage of this a bit more than I should. But anyhow, uh, so... But you already heard that there are some other things that one does. Remember, I was, I'm planning to go a bit beyond just this, basic, uh, just this basic algorithm. And yeah, I mean, you could imagine a third and a fourth part, and I might say a bit about this, but before going there, uh, there, you know, there, there's, there is a main, one of the risks of writing canons that you're so lost in what's going to happen next that you don't have enough uh, freedom left over to have an overall arch like we saw even in our basic uh, round that we started with. So, uh, and we have examples of classical canons which do have this property and of course I brought one with me but didn't bring, oh thank you. So one of the first pieces that people tend to learn that has an interesting canon in it. Can you see this? Uh, maybe if I bring it a bit closer. Okay, you've probably all recognized this one, even if you don't, well, it's not from the score, then I play a few bars of it, even if you might not have recognized that it's a strict canon for the first half of the piece. At this point, it diverges a bit from being a strict canon. And you see already, he is stringing together some of these, you know, a few things that, a few of the trivial solutions that I mentioned already, and some other things that I'll tell you in a minute about. But overall, it makes for, you know, it lets him get from, from one place to another, you know, from F major here to C major when we've left off, and you basically construct a whole piece around it. So what are these trivial components that he's putting together in interesting ways? Well, one of them is this AAA business. He's basically arpeggiating a chord. More, uh, most obviously here, but this is still this is still the same chord. And you notice that he makes sure to modify it every other beat, so that every other bar, so that you always have somebody, one of the two hands, playing the actual chord. So that gets us all the way up to the fourth bar, where the right hand does this, and then the next left hand will be, and then it does something else, which is sequences, right? So there are these transformations that we learn in basic theory, which, let's say, take any, any, maybe I shouldn't have used the prime here, so uh, tra transposition of A, in this case, let's say transposition by minus two because we are in a, uh, what do you call it, in a diatonic setting. So if you take this one, 
and then transpose it down to, transpose it again, transpose it again, and he's not going to keep going like this. That would be PDQ Bach. But uh, if, as, so, as long as you've made sure that A uh, works with its own transposition, well, then you can keep going because this Twitter relation is invariant under transposition. So t minus 2a can x go to t minus 4a, then t minus 6, t minus 2, t minus 4, etc. And then you have, uh, well, what happened here? Oh, oops. <laughs> and that accounts for the next three bars of the piece, right? Uh, you can't see it from here. Here we go. Right, so. And now we're back to major chords. Oh wait, you're cheating, J JS. Sorry. No. But that's okay, he's writing music, not counterpoint exercises, so he's allowed to vary the the, the part below and uh, to, to make it go in a new direction and then, you know, we're still more or less in the same canonic situation. And then we start over again. So that's one thing you can do, which is put together these sequences and major tries and, you know, Bach did it and Mozart saw it and learned that, okay, that's a good way to write extended canon. So for K576, we have one of these sequences, t, t minus one, t minus two, t minus three. Sorry. Sorry. So you, you, you can hear there's a few hiccups there. But that's still a sequence at one higher level. That's one thing that you can do, which is to exploit the structure of this system, of the existence of these sequences. And so, for example, to give yet another application before I go on, I know I don't have much time left. Uh, so once you have discovered that, I don't know, that the first two bars of this work in canon, something else to end. Also works the other way around. Now this isn't quite, the fact that those two solutions both work, isn't quite a triviality because I'm not, this is not what they call invertible counterpoint at the octave, it's invertible counterpoint at the 12th. Right, so invertible counterpoint is sort of the final generalization of canons where you're allowed to have any, you know, A, B, C, D, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, any two voices in counterpoint as long as they also, as long as there is also some other transformation where they still work in counterpoint. Invertible would often mean that the alpha prime, beta prime, etc., are above the one before. And so, you know, if you go through uh, Renaissance music where this was a very common thing, they'd, they'd give you a, a list of all of the intervals for which, you know, depending on this transformation, they work both in, well, in this case, you would, you would have them in the same capacity, which they work both below and above translated by a twelfth. And then if you're, if you have gone through this enough, you can actually hear, oh, okay, this bit of counterpoint doesn't use the one forbidden interval, and so he's almost certainly going to bring it back in the vertebral counterpoint to exploit that. And then you run into the Brahms uh, Haydn variations, I believe it is. Uh, oh, just got it. I'm 
know, you name these intervals, mean the fifth plus an octave. So uh, you take each one of these down a fifth and bring it below the theme instead of above it. But There are six all the way through here, and the six is the one forbidden interval, because if you take this up at twelfth, yeah? but you see Brahms is being clever here, he actually writes, so these other notes, these offbeat notes, serve one function here, which is their sort of are sort of like uh, anticipations of the chord note, but when you re reverse it, so each of these forbidden sevens becomes a nice suspension. So that's an example of where you really have to leave behind the, you know, the mathematical theory and exploit some very special aspects of your, uh, you know, of the system of counterpoint you're writing, because mathematics doesn't really, you know, know about suspensions and, uh, <laughs> uh, and anticipations, etc. Just to give a final example before I let our other panelists uh, speak, uh, so I started here indicating a three-part canon, and it's almost always true whether you're writing uh, you know, Three Blind Mice or the Chostakovich Czech Piano Trio, if you're going to have a three-part canon, then the second and third parts will be in the same relation to the first and second, as to each other as the first and second parts. Why? Because that makes sure that this third voice has to satisfy, or if you imagine constructing them algorithmically, this new bit, the C, has to satisfy only, you know, there's only one further condition, which is that C has to go together with this A together with B thing, which we already made sure worked when we made a two-part canon. They say that we already made sure that voices two and three would work with each other because they're in the same relation as voices one and two. It's very rare that you find a canon that doesn't do that. A famous example is the music that's sometimes known as Non Nobis Domine. where you notice that voices one and two are one beat apart, whereas voices two and three do, 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 do. they are two beats apart and they're also off by a fifth instead of a fourth. Uh, it won't work if you just try it. Each pair of voices, one and two and two and three, work automatically, but the one and three configuration fails. And so here you had to, whoever constructed this, and I think it, it's still anonymous, it used to be attributed to Mozart, but it's way before him, and it's not by Bird either. You have this very complicated set of constraints where A has to go both with C and D and with B, and, uh, and then this D has to go with B has to go with B because it's going to appear here, and then you have to find an E that will work with this one and will also make sense with C, etc. And so you can see it, most of these canons are, you know, they don't, they don't last for very long and you don't find many of them. And the ones you often, you, some, you often do find actually extend to four parts, which you might think would be harder, and in some sense it is, but uh, has the, has the uh, feature that you can think about it Mathematically, as really a compound canon where we have the canon of the voices one and two and the canon of voices three and four, and these compound structures themselves work, form a canon with each other. Or alternatively, you could think of voices one and three forming a canon that's in canon with voices two and four. I'm not just making this up. There are, ac there are actually a few examples of this in the literature. I thought I brought one with me. Um, 
Here it is. So this is from a, a piece by Brahms that started out as Misa Canonica, Mass and Canon, but eventually got adapted into uh, Warum ist das Licht gegeben? So, uh, and you can see this construction here. Voices five and six will be silent till the end. Voices one and two are in this relation, and voices three and four are in the same relation, but they are off by the same kind of fourth and then a fifth pattern that we saw in uh, Non Nobis. Uh, Etc. Maybe I should have shown you the continuation of this, so I'm not just making it up. But uh, yeah. So and again, it's a very relatively short excerpt, and by the time he gets back, he gives himself a few bars of rest, and then it starts over again. Uh, as long as we're on the topic of Bach, uh, of Brahms, excuse me, uh, I'll come back to Bach, Bach in the end. Uh, here is a rather complicated construction where, the ca where there are lots of local canons, but I urge you to look at the bass. part canon augmentation, and you might think, well, those must be almost trivial because, you know, I, once I know B, I can figure out C and D, and then I have C and so forth, and then I'm going to run out of music in the right hand, and I can just finish off wherever I like. But no, because Brahms then repeats the faster part, so you have this complicated fractal-like constraint Right, so this A has to go both with itself at half time and itself at double time and with D, and this D has to go with E and B and A at various, and the whole, each one of them is satisfying two conditions, and even Brahms can do it only by, well, first cheating a bit, the second F starts a bit too early, and by putting in all this rich other counterpoint between the two parts. Uh, oh, I guess I should show you what happens at the end. Ah actually show it to you. Uh, why is this not going? Ah, here we go. And I'm talking about, since I'm, I'm talking about Canon, I mentioned Bach. I really should finish with the Goldberg variations because we're going to hear them tonight. The nice thing about the Goldberg variations, every third one of them is a Canon. Variation three is a Canon to unison. Variation six is a Canon to second. Nine is a Canon to third. And here, the extra condition is besides the fact that, uh, ah, where did I give you my initial diagram? So there is this additional condition that besides having this plain kind of two-part counterpoint, there is a harmony of all of the Goldberg variations are versions of the same harmony, which it makes possible, by the way, to mix and match them, play the first two bars of the first piece and the next two bars of the next one, and it sort of makes sense, but that I won't get to demonstrate today. Maybe you can catch me at the piano sometime during this weekend. But besides satisfying this canonic constraint, they all have to make sense with the same harmony. And so that's the kind of constraint that, well, I'm wondering just how hard would it be to do such a thing. And there are 30 Goldberg variations, so the last ones are cans at the ninth and sort of at the tenth. It's actually a quote bit, which has cans at every interval from the first to the tenth. So I'm going to play you to finish off a, uh, a pair of canons at the twelfth, which you know, I can pretend might have been variation 36 if uh, Bach had gotten around to writing just a few more Goldberg variations. 
So these are berets, and again, the condition, there, there is another condition on the bach Goldberg's No two of them are allowed to sound the same. So if I'm going to pretend I'm writing a new one, it can't sound like any of the other 30 that Bach wrote already. So I'll finish off with quote unquote variation 36, and you'll hear the actual Goldberg variations tonight. Thank you.